I saw this one that made me laugh so hard. <laughs> your body has ran out of magnesium. By the way, ran instead of run. I don't know, but your body ran out of magnesium. <laughs> oh my God, zero MG. <laughs> I don't know why that one makes me laugh so much, but there we go. Uh, okay, these memes are more for me than for you maybe, but uh, there we go. So we'll talk about emission and absorption spectra. And it's important to remember what we've learned before, that if the electrons in an atom get excited, maybe through thermal energy or through a potential difference or something, they move up in energy level. So they go up, and then, of course, they go down. And remember what happens when they go down. When they drop down, they emit photons. Each of these photons right here will have a slightly different um, wavelength or even frequency. And remember that each of these photons has this energy E equals HF. This is what we've learned before. Okay, so what does this, what can we do with this? Well, this means that if you excite these electrons in a particular atom, so for example, hydrogen or helium or whatever element you want. For example, here we've got hydrogen here. For example, we've got sodium, which is Na. The in interesting thing is because there's only certain, you know, of these are here allowed, that means you've got these discrete atomic energy levels. And what does discrete means? Uh, discrete means it's quantized, which means like only certain values are allowed. Now, what I think is really interesting about this is that this means that each element, so each particular element, for example, hydrogen, it has its own very particular and unique set of these lines. In other words, this becomes a fingerprint. So just like your fingerprint you know, is, is supposed to be unique to just you in the world, well, each element has its own unique fingerprint. This is a spectral fingerprint. This is super important. So for example, this particular line right here, this is the emission spectrum. And so, by the way, you'll notice sometimes some of these uh, drawings, they show, for example, the wavelength increasing, for example, and sometimes they show the wavelength increasing this way. It's a bit weird. So just always be careful with these right here. But if you look at this right here, 656, for example, uh, that's a very specific um, transition. That's actually something that we call hydrogen alpha. You don't have to know this right here, but I think it's just interesting. So for example, this particular one at 656 nanometers, that's just this nice sort of red looking hydrogen alpha one. And sodium just has this. So every atom has its own unique pattern of light. And it's important to know that what we're looking at here is emission spectra are black background with colored lines. And depending on the pattern, like I said, is you can tell what it is. This is how astronomers or astrophysicists, for example, we can you know, look at a gas or a star or something and be able to tell what's in it because we see these different unique fingerprints. Okay, so a gas can also absorb a photon if it has the right energy. So this is called absorption spectra. So it looks very similar, right? This is when the light is first going through a gas and the gas is basically eating those things. Do you notice though for the hydrogen one, it's still got these same lines. So for example, we were looking at this, you know, hydrogen alpha before at 656. It's still there. It's just that it's all color with black. Same thing with these really strong two double ones right here, for example, for sodium that we saw before. They're there as well. So that's why, you know, it looks bright, but it has black lines. That's because the missing light was absorbed by the gas. Now, I couldn't resist, but <laughs> give you this one here. Look at this. It's awesome. I was going to make a joke about sodium and hydrogen, but nah, so good. So what do these different absorption and emission spectra tell us? And just to remind you, this I think is a nice drawing that kind of shows everything together here. So emission ones, hot gas, for example, it could be the element, could be a gas, could be the star. You know, it just goes through and it just emits at these. Whereas absorption spectra, you've got your hot thing and then you've got your cold gas and you're able to basically tell what the gas is made of because it's been absorbing these different lines. Okay, so these specific absorption and emission lines, these discrete ones, that tells you, hey, atomic levels must be discrete. That's what it's evidence for. And this unique pattern in lines, for example, hydrogen or helium or sodium or whatever, well, that tells you the chemical composition. So I think it's important to know these sort of, these two pieces of information here that, you know, what these each tell you. This is something you could be asked on an exam. So for example, you can tell what a star is made of, like I showed, here's actually some of the different patterns. So you can see, for example, different stars have these different, you know, characteristic patterns because they have different atoms in them. So you can tell what stars are made of. Also though, you, it's really interesting if, for example, in the lab, if this here is the pattern you normally see, and you end up seeing this, but it's all been shifted. It's like all the lines were shifted either to the left, uh, in this case here, which is red shifted, or to the right, which is blue shifted. 
Now remember, this could be inverted. Basically, if all the lines are to higher wavelengths, so we call it red shifted. If they've all been shifted to the right, then we say, or, or to lower wavelengths, we say it's been blue shifted. Now, why do we care about that? Well, that's because we have this Doppler effect. So do you remember that equation for Doppler effect for uh, astronomy? It goes like this. So delta F over F, the change in frequency over the original frequency. Well, that equals the change in wavelength over the original wavelength, which is approximately equal to V over C. What does that mean? Well, that tells you that the change, this shift, for example, in wavelength or frequency, that can tell you something about the speed of the object. Now this right here is maybe an interesting, well, I don't know if you'll find it interesting, but this uh, red, for example, right here, um, this is a picture that I took, actually. I took this picture right here when I was working as an astronomer. Um, it's a galaxy called NGC 7479. It's got a really boring name, and I felt bad for it, so I wanted to take a sort of pretty picture of it. So there it is. Now, this right here, what I was making in red, this is a very specific um, hydrogen alpha, in fact. So that's supposed to be at 656 nanometers. Here's the problem. This is a galaxy that's going away. It's, I mean, this thing, this galaxy is millions of light years away. So that means it's, it's really, really far away. And because it's far away, it's also really moving fast. And because it's moving fast, that means all of these lines are here are redshifted. So if I was looking for this specific 656 nanometers, I can't actually be looking at 656 here on Earth. I have to be actually, I had to do the calculations to see how much it was shifted by and you put a filter there so you could see it but i think it's really interesting because you can end up you know having these weird effects that tell you something about speed because all these lines have been shifted now this is not anything you need for your exams but i think is so cool so we can start to tell something about the chemical composition of exoplanets and what's an exoplanet? That's a planet that's found around another star. So we started detecting, we've got thousands of them now that have been confirmed. I mean, just a, like, a, like a decade or two ago, we didn't know if there was any for sure, other than you know, the only planets around our, our solar system were the only planets we knew for sure. Now we know there's thousands of other planets around other stars. In fact, we figure it's pretty much every star has an exoplanet. Now, why is that important? Well, what if we're looking for life? What if, for example, we want to study this astrobiology, which is a study of life on other planets? Well, if we're going to find those, and these are the ones we've been finding lots of these planets, we can do something really, really clever. If the planet happens to, watch this, so if this so here is a star and the planet happens to pass in front of the star, because you have to be lined up, it has to be lucky, because obviously you could be up or down or whatever, but if you happen to be lined up with that planet passing in front of its star, and there's lots of them that are like this, then what we can do is we can take high frequency spectrographs. So in other words, we take a whole bunch of spectral images, you know, of these different wavelengths, of the first the star initially, so that way you can see what the background, you know, what all the lines are for the star, and then right at it, when you time it right, right when that planet passes in front of it, you take a whole bunch of images to tell then what's the difference. And that difference is going to be light that passed through that planet's atmosphere. We found tons of planets that actually have atmosphere, which is really cool. And this is just one example. For example, this K218b, but there's, there's tons of them. There's lots of these. You can look them up and see what's new. But basically, through the James Webb Telescope, they took this image right here, and they can detect, for example, carbon dioxide and methane. By the way, those are greenhouse gases. I mean, methane, for example, is caused, uh, at least on Earth, uh, one cause of methane. There's lots of them, but one cause of methane is like cows farting. So who knows? Maybe we just found some signs of alien cow farts. Who knows? There's also some, uh, some other processes that could cause it. But I think it's really fascinating that we can start already detecting, for example, methane, carbon dioxide, and H2O in the atmospheres of exoplanets. Isn't that cool?